I'd like to welcome everybody to this session. Our speaker today is Dr. Rothenberg. He's a practicing rheumatologist in Bethesda, Maryland, with special interest in patients with fibromyalgia syndrome, systemic lupus, musculoskeletal pain, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, hypermobile joint sy syndrome, difficult to diagnose and treat rheumatology in internal medicine patients. Dr. Rothenberg emphasizes on optimizing patients' health, minimizing disease, and helping them reach their most functional ability. Preventative care has kept most of his patients out of the hospital and significantly improved their ability to function through comprehensive good health practices. He's on staff of Suburban Hospital, and in 2017, he started a concierge primary care rheumatology practice to complement his consultative rheumatology practice. He's going to be presenting some slides for us, and after he's concluded his slides, we will have some time for question and answer. This is a live streaming session, so we will have some questions from our live streaming participants. That said, if you have a burning um, question during his talk, you can always come up to one of the microphones and ask a question. Um, my name is Rory, and I'm here to help you during the session, so if you need anything, I'll be sitting over in the corner and just flag me down. So without any further ado, here's Dr. Rothenberg. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Um, thank you for that nice introduction. I, I thought I would have to introduce myself, but um, one thing I'd like to add is that it's really um, a pleasure to be here today because um, not only am I in private practice, but um, I have a real interest in patients with chronic arthritis, pain, and fatigue. And so this gives me a venue to talk about it a little bit. Um, when I started my practice in rheumatology, I was particularly interested in uh, patients with lupus and Sjogren's syndrome, and those patients have an increased incidence of a second problem called uh, fibromyalgia. And uh, so basically, we would see that there'd be patients that had, you know, the findings that we see with chronic arthritis, but then some of them would have more, like more pain, more stiffness, more achiness. And I was able, through the research and other things in my teaching program, to identify that these patients had concurrent uh, fibromyalgia or myofascial pain around their joints. And so that's where it all started. And I think I, I have a reputation in the community as being a rheumatologist that has an interest in the arthritis, pain, and fatigue of rheumatology patients as well as fibromyalgia. So it's a pleasure to be here today and get a chance to talk to you all. Okay. So with that being said, I do need to say that, you know, the talk itself is an educational talk. I'm not giving you specific advice for your particular condition, uh, but at the same time, it, it was prepared by myself, a rheumatologist, and you can use this information to go to your treating doctor and hopefully get some input into things that might be able to help with your uh, uh, arthritis pain and fatigue. Okay, so the first thing we need to know is that about 15 years ago, everything changed in rheumatology. Um, before that, we had more nonspecific drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis, and about 15 years ago, we started to have the biologic medications. And those drugs changed uh, rheumatologists' uh, career. Um, and instead of just being very nice doctors who helped you get through a disabling illness, suddenly we had uh, focused, targeted medications that could really help reduce all the pain and swelling. And so uh, with these targeted biologics, as well as what we call disease, modifying medications called uh, DMARDs, and the big one that everybody knows about is methotrexate, but there are others. Um, we have dramatically improved the prognosis for rheumatoid arthritis and chronic arthritis patients. Um, and um, the caveat is you have to be able to afford the medications and tolerate the medications, but if you can, there's a dramatic improvement in swollen joints, there's a dramatic reduction in an inflammation test called C-reactive protein, or CRP, and we know that new bone erosions are very, very significantly reduced. We can actually eliminate in many patients the inflammation that used to be so disabling that 
uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for example, would become disabled within eight years of diagnosis. And much of that has changed. However, it is very important to realize that these are targeted therapies, which means that if a patient has rheumatoid arthritis, uh, they're treated one way. If they have psoriatic arthritis, they're treated another way. If they have osteoarthritis, they're treated another way. And it's important that we understand that what you're being treated for can now be more targeted to the problems that you have. And uh, the, it, the big thing today that I'd like to talk about is with hopefully this better prognosis, meaning that you have now much less inflammation in your joints, not as many arthritis flares, the challenge right now is getting back into life, okay? Because that is really a big deal in many, many patients' minds and their families. Okay, so um, I asked a question back in 2005. Uh, what if biologic and DMARD medications do not correct the rheumatoid arthritis, chronic arthritis pain fatigue, and inability to function, what do you do next? And I was involved in a study where we went to major rheumatology centers around the country. The study was called Dialogues in Rheumatology, and it was uh, published in the uh, Journal of Rheumatology, Exper uh, Clinical Rheumatology, um, and uh, we went to major centers, and we were really surprised that the, the major answer was that we leave the pain management to the pain management specialist. And they're really important in terms of managing pain, and I'm not in any way trying to diminish uh, the, the expertise and the help that pain management doctors give us. However, rheumatologists know more about uh, chronic arthritis patients than any other subspecialty. And that's why the title of my talk today is a rheumatologist strategy for managing pain and fatigue. So how do I approach a patient? As I said, we try to start with the controlling the arthritis inflammation and the flares with biologic and DMARD medications. However, we also need to manage chronic pain and fatigue. And we'll be talking a lot about that today. If we can manage chronic pain and fatigue, hopefully we can improve muscle tone and physical function. And when we are reasonably successful with that, then we're trying to manage activities of daily living and getting back into life. And getting back into life may be going back to work or it may be getting involved in any activity that is important to you and your family and uh, your significant others. So this is the focus that from today. And um, when we uh, talk about um, uh, managing arthritis, pain, and fatigue, we have to talk about arthritis comorbidities associated with chronic pain and fatigue. Now, we're very lucky that we have uh, Dr. Daniel um, L. Bogdati talking this afternoon in much greater depth about the comorbidities of chronic arthritis. Uh, but I'm just going to approach it a little bit from the point of view of arthritis, pain, and fatigue, okay? So bear with me one second. Okay, so with the comorbidity of anxiety, we know that patients that have chronic pain, if they are having more anxiety that, for example, when am I gonna have my next arthritis flare? When is the next shoe gonna drop, you know? Uh, this is shown in scientific studies to be an important factor in terms of chronic arthritis pain. They've actually done brain uh, MRI, functional MRI studies, and they've actually shown that when a patient has increased pain or increased anxiety, the same uh, locations in the brain light up. So we know that if we can help manage the anxiety associated with chronic pain, we can also help diminish some of that secondary pain. Uh, the second thing is we know that rheumatoid arthritis and other chronic arthritis patients have an increased risk of depression. And I find that it's really more dysthymia than depression. Uh, 
And the, what that means is that if you did not have depression before you went into having a chronic arthritis condition, you really are getting very unhappy appropriately because <laughs> things have changed so dramatically in your life. But that causes chronic fatigue. And it's very important to recognize that we need to deal with depression from a fatigue and arthritis pain perspective. Um, obesity, I don't like that word, overweight. Um, we know that some people have a tendency, well, first of all, in the United States, there's an epidemic of people being overweight. And if you have a tendency to be a couch potato because you, it hurts too much to get up or you're a little depressed because of the things that are going on, that increased weight puts undue stress on your low back, your hips, your knees, your feet, your gait. So it becomes a vicious cycle. So I think that the key thing is that this is an important comorbidity uh, from the perspective that we want to get people functional, okay? So nobody's going to go back to the weight they were when they were a teenager. But the important thing is we try to manage excess weight that gets in the way of what's going on from an arthritis point of view. Non-restorative sleep, very, very important in chronic arthritis and fatigue. Um, if a person has chronic arthritis pain, that disrupts their sleep, and they develop um, uh, daytime somnolence, and also what they develop is decreased uh, pain tolerance. So the same stubbed toe feels much worse when you're functioning and struggling to be able to uh, manage that sleep problem. And at the same time, if we disrupt the sleep cycle, the REM sleep and the stage uh, uh, four uh, sleep that is associated with sleep problems, uh, we then find out that we disrupt circadian rhythm. And circadian rhythm is the natural sleep-wake cycle where you're supposed to get up in the morning when the sun rises and more or less go to sleep when the sun sets. Um, and when you have a disruption in circadian rhythm, they actually have done studies to show that you have increased cytokines, one of the arthritis chemicals in the brain, and you also have a decreased immune system. And so if we can kind of manage sleep and circadian rhythm a little bit better, along with everything else, it definitely helps patients function better. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about fibromyalgia and myofascial pain on uh, further slides, which is a real interest of mine. Um, but it's now listed as a, a comorbidity for chronic arthritis, and I feel that that's a big improvement over where it was 20 years ago. Okay, so medication um, for nocturnal pain and insomnia. Well, this can be really simple. You know, using a, a time-release Tylenol, as long as you're not taking too much total amount of Tylenol during a 24-hour period can be very, very helpful in improving nocturnal pain, nocturnal pro, uh, uh, insomnia caused by nocturnal arthritis pain. And it improves pain tolerance and fatigue, like we were talking about. Uh, Long-term uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, like taking a, a, a leave or naproxen in the evening or uh, celecoxib or Celebrex uh, once a day can definitely help manage nocturnal pain and fatigue. But here's where we're going to get a little bit um, outside the box. If those medicines don't work, there is a medication called tramadol, an atypical opioid medication that can definitely help supplement um, chronic pain and fatigue. And so I wanted to spend a little time today talking about the opioid uh, pain dilemma, because many of my patients say, Dr. Rothenberg, I'm doing what? well. Why do people look at me like, like I'm taking tramadol? And, you know, when, you know, what, but the problem is that there is an opioid crisis. You only have to read the paper every day, and there's something in there. And uh, people have problems with these medicines, and certainly, if your arthritis pain can be managed adequately with Tylenol or non-steroidal meds, you don't need to take an opioid medication, even a weak opioid medication. 
but it is important to understand the risks and benefits of tramadol, which is not a typical opioid. It is an atypical opioid. So we have this organization called the Drug Enforcement Agency, and they have five levels of, uh, of scheduled substances, controlled substances. Schedule two is the medications that are at the highest risk, and we're talking about the morphines, the oxycodones, and the hydrocodones. And those medications, uh, you can't call into a pharmacy. The doctor has to write a prescription. They have to do various monitoring of you if you're on these medications. It's become a much bigger deal. And there are a lot of people who have problems with these meds, so it's probably very, very reasonable that they're doing what they're doing. Um, though I will just go back a second that um, one of my uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Anish Singla, wrote a book on um, uh, chronic pain, and he wrote in there, and he's a pain management doctor, he said if somebody's doing well with their pain medication and they're functional, I don't see why they have to be stopped. But the important thing I would like to talk about is that as we go down the schedule, um, the drugs have a little bit less risk of addiction. Tylenol with codeine, uh, Tylenol number three is in schedule three, and then in schedule four, we have a low uh, risk of addiction. And I'm simplifying, Grant, that, you know, but the medications in this uh, schedule are the uh, tranquilizers, such as Valium or Diazepam, Xanax or Alprazolam, um, and many people have taken those type of medications at some point in their lives um, for various reasons. And then the atypical opioid, tramadol. So I think it does help to see that that's the level of control we're talking about. We're not talking about Schedule 2 or Schedule 3. Um, but I don't want to minimize the fact that there are people who could have problems with this medicine, and we need to deal with that seriously. Okay, so tramadol was first labeled a controlled uh, substance in 2015. That means before that, it was not a controlled substance. And that, to me, means most people don't have a problem with the medication, but certainly some people do. And because of that, it's now a controlled uh, scheduled substance. The FDA, Food and Drug Administration, labels it as an opioid and a neurotransmitter analgesic, an SNRI. And remember the letters SNRI, because I'm gonna be talking about that in a couple of minutes. Um, and that was what makes it an atypical opioid. It has both opioid properties and SNRI, central nervous system properties. And then finally, in Schedule 5, we have, which is the lowest schedule, uh, very low risk of addiction. But people can have problems with cough syrup, with codeine. So whatever controlled substance you're having, if you don't use it properly, you can have a problem with it. But if you use it properly, it can improve your pain and uh, control. So when we talk about managing pain, we really want to also understand that uh, we need to know what the peripheral nerves that carry pain signals are and the central nervous system pain pathways that carry nerve signals. So the peripheral uh, nerves, um, and it's really not that complicated, I, I hope it's not too complicated for you folks, um, are what we feel in our arms and legs. These are often sharp or burning pains, and they tend to be uh, described as acute pain, okay? And then the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord uh, nerves, uh, can transmit a different type of pain. And this type of pain is often more achy and diffuse. And often, after you've had acute pain for three months on a regular basis, you often develop something called chronic pain, okay? Now, I'm simplifying, okay, because people have peripheral neuropathy. They have all kinds of different pains. But it's helpful to think about it in a more simple fashion so you can understand my next slide and this slide. So we know that there are medications called SNRI, serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, uh, and those are drugs that have transmitters in the brain that mod modulate pain. And Cymbalta, or duloxetine, is a very good example 
of a medication that can help a lot of people with chronic pain and chronic fatigue. It's effective in the, uh, reducing central nervous system neurologic pain. And also, Cymbalta is FDA uh, approved for indications including joint pain, arthritis pain, back pain, anxiety, depression, fibromyalgia, pain and function, and I forgot one, which was diabetic uh, uh, nerve pain. And so my point is that if you have a drug that is approved for all those indications, it's more targeted. And that's a very good thing. That means that patients taking this medication, if you have the problem targeted, there's a good chance that it's going to help you more specifically than just um, a medication that's not indicated for all these things. Um, the important thing is that when you give a person a medication like Cymbalta and they have chronic arthritis pain, they're still going to need treatment for their arthritis condition. But the, we're talking about the patients that might have a little more pain and stiffness. Remember going back to the study I did when we asked the rheumatologists in major rheumatology centers, what do you do with people that have pain above you know, the normal uh, arthritis pain? And that's when they said we send them to pain clinics. And these are some of the strategies that pain management doctors will do also but we try to directly uh, uh, approach it in what a rheumatology patient would need. Okay, so here's an interesting concept, okay? If you have difficult to treat pain and you're treating chronic pain through more than one uh, nerve pathway, it reduces the amount of medication needed to manage the pain, which means it reduces the side effects. Um, so Tylenol and Tramadol. If you use Tylenol, it treats more of the peripheral nerve pain. If you use Tramadol, it treats more of the central nerve pain. And again, this is a simplification, but the important thing is it's a concept, okay? It doesn't pay to take too much of the Tylenol or the Tramadol because there's only so much each one of these medicines can do. Um, another example would be the non drugs your ibuprofens, your naproxens, your um, uh, celecoxib or celebrex type medications, along with tramadol. This basically shows that for the most part, the NSAIDs work on the peripheral pain pathways and the tramadol, uh, the atypical opioid with its SNRI qualities, works on the central nervous system. And this gives you improved pain control and then the question is, what do you do with that increased pain control? But before I get into that question, I wouldn't be a rheumatologist without having one slide on prednisone or steroid therapy, <laughs> okay? Because how do you manage arthritis flares, okay? You need a little prednisone. It's either a bolus orally or it's an injection into your joint. Um, and it often helps with arthritis pain and fatigue which is fascinating because it's not a pain medication. But it's one of those perfect examples, and I, probably everybody in the room who's had prednisone or a steroid injection in some way can say, oh yeah, it helped pain as well as the swelling. Why is that? Well, because that inflammation goes into the brain, causes an increase in the cytokines, and I'm simplifying everything, but that causes you to have increased pain and fatigue. So here's a perfect example how better treatment for arthritis can actually reduce pain and fatigue. Um, however, um, it, you know, it would be wonderful if everybody could take a low-dose prednisone that has arthritis pain, uh, 3 to 10 milligrams. However, um, that's very good for some people, but even at that dose, there's an increased risk of infection because it weakens the immune system. Um, there's an increased risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Fortunately, we have medications called bisphosphonates. Examples are Actinel and Fosamax that are FDA indicated to reduce steroid-induced osteoporosis. And so if you're on long-term prednisone, you should ask your doctor if I need to be on a medication to reduce the risk of osteoporosis from that medication. Um, these drugs can cause weight gain 
and they can cause cushionoid side effects where you get the swelling of your face, the buffalo hump, and various other problems. In uh, 1950s, when prednisone was first invented, it was a wonder duck drug. People threw away their canes, you know, they got out of their wheelchairs, and they were great. But then they started having osteoporotic uh, fractures of their spine. They wound up becoming diabetic. And so five to six months later, doctors said, we got to rethink this, okay? But anyway, used appropriately, it's very important. One little caveat I'd like to mention is the risk of side effects from uh, prednisone and steroids is cumulative. So if you've had a couple of joint injections, you had a couple of boluses of prednisone uh, because of arthritis flares, and you're on a little prednisone uh, uh, on a daily basis, and you might have a little inhaled prednisone steroids for asthma, you have to add up, have your doctor add up the whole amount, okay? And you might be shocked to say, wait a second, I'm on three milligrams a day if I add up everything I'm taking. And that's important to recognize that when a person's had a lot of flares, it might actually make sense, at least short term, to put them on a little prednisone every day. Okay, so uh, we try to uh, function uh, with chronic pain, but chronic pain is also fatiguing. And that's really the second part of the talk, okay? Which is that uh, managing chronic pain can sometimes manage chronic fatigue. Now, granted, if you have another reason for chronic fatigue, like anemia or uh, medication side effects or just deconditioning or something else, it's not going to manage it. But the important thing is, in many patients, if you can manage the chronic pain and become a little bit more active physically and do some of the things I'm going to talk about in a couple of seconds, you then can decrease uh, your uh, chronic fatigue. However, if you take too much pain medication, you could actually get increased fatigue. And people all often ask me this question, how much is the right amount of pain medication? Well, if you become more functional and you don't have side effects, that's good. If you have increased fatigue, even though you have less pain, that's usually bad, okay? So it, it, it's the question that people ask a lot, okay? And we know that sometimes you can target medications. You may just wake up with uh, morning stiffness and acheness, and you just need a little of a short-acting ibuprofen type uh, NSAID in the morning just to get started. And the risk of taking ibuprofen once a day versus three times a day, which then makes it a, um, a long-acting uh, NSAID, are much different. And people think, well, because it says it's not that much of a problem, I take it three times a day and say, wait a second, that's not the same as taking it just in the morning, okay? So anyway, that's one uh, problem. Um, if you are uh, more functional, meaning that if your pain and fatigue are down, you can be more active, and hopefully that is a way to hopefully approach uh, life slightly different. If you're waiting for the other shoe to drop and you figure you're going to have an arthritis flare tomorrow, you tend to be a little bit more of a half-empty person instead of a half-full person. But it doesn't pay to try to be optimistic if you're going to have a flare tomorrow, you know, or you're not going to be able to manage what you have. So the important thing is that if we can control pain and fatigue, if we can keep the arthritis, inflammation, and disease down with all these medicines we're talking about, we have a better chance of uh, managing arthritis pain and achieving the goals of better muscle tone, more fluid gait, meaning not as stiff, uh, not working against your body, and better exercise and increased endorphins. Does everybody in the room know what endorphins are? I don't need to tell you, okay. It's your own natural opioids. So in other words, everybody is on opioids if they're getting exercise and they're improving their endorphins. Okay. Fibromyalgia patients, I, I promised you I'd get back to that, tend to have increased generalized fatigue and pain. They also have a couple other things that are unique. They tend to have something called increased autonomic nervous system dysfunction. And what does that mean? They just seem to have more irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bladder syndrome, 
they tend to get insomnia because they have heart racing at night. And that's not because of anxiety. It's because they have increased uh, uh, simulation of their nervous system. Uh, everybody's probably heard of the fight or flight, um, uh, how a mother can pick up a car and get their child out from underneath the car if there's an emergency. But if you have that fight or flight uh, hormone going all the time, you're gonna get exhausted besides hurting yourself. And that's very important to recognize that we need to control it a little bit. We wanna have energy, but we wanna control it enough so we don't have insomnia. Fibromyalgia patients also seem to have increased sensitivity to medications. So we're gonna just basically uh, look at this last piece right here. Um, I wrote an article which is on my website, russellrothenbergmd.com, um, under articles. It's called The Fibromyalgia Pathophysiology and Treatment, A Guide to Patients and Physicians. And you can go to my website, you can uh, download the article, print it, take it to anyone you want, and, and, but more important, take it to your physician. A lot of physicians are amazed. They say, I didn't know that fibromyalgia was associated with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome. That's really interesting. And I'd never understood why fibromyalgia patients had these extra symptoms. And so it's a useful tool, and um, I would recommend that if people have problems with, of this nature, I would definitely download the article and take it to your doctor. Okay, myofascial pain, let's talk about that. Uh, myofascial pain is a cousin of fibromyalgia. We know that if a person has myofascial pain all over their body, then they're kind of called a fibromyalgia patient. But what is myofascial pain? It is caused, and I'm simplifying again, by decreased blood flow and increased uh, nerve pain. So if you have a tight area in your neck or in your chest wall that is tender and stiff, it actually compresses the nerve and causes nerve pain because there's nerves all over your body. Okay, so this localized uh, soft tissue pain can cause very painful soft tissue knots or what is written a lot, trigger points, okay? And those trigger points can squeeze a nerve, cause that type of pain. It's very often to have those uh, uh, tender points in your flexor muscles, either your shoulder flexors or your hip flexor muscles. But sometimes you can have myofascial pain around the joint, which is complicating your arthritis situation. So if you have myofascial pain around your knee and the orthopedic doctor says, well, you have osteoarthritis of your knee, a lot of doctors don't identify that the person could also have myofascial pain or this a lack of blood flow around their knee causing increased pain and stiffness, and both problems are causing the person to become dysfunctional. So if you get a cortisone injection into your knee and it doesn't work, think maybe I have something else also. Maybe I have this myofascial pain uh, with the uh, arthritis. But also, you can have myofascial pain or trigger points anywhere in your body. And when they become unmanaged, um, then you start to develop something after about three months called fibromyalgia. Okay, fibromyalgia pain flare. Um, there is a misconception in my mind, it, experience with my patients, that fibromyalgia patients are pain seekers, okay? In my experience, they don't even know that they're having significant pain until the pain gets overwhelming. And that can cause increased severe diffuse pain and exhaustion. So as everybody in the room knows, if you don't treat your pain, eventually it's going to spread and become more and more symptomatic to the point that it becomes a bigger problem. And if you took care of it, were able to manage it earlier, it might not have gotten that bad. So here's another thought, okay? Fibromyalgia is associated with rheumatic diseases, so we can get what I call a double whammy. Um, if you're having an arthritis flare and you also have fibromyalgia, you can get a flare of both of those problems. And those are some of the patients that I get to see because they didn't respond to the regular therapy and the doctor is saying, I'm not really sure what's going on. I don't know 
why they're not responding. And it's not infrequent that a rheumatology patient or a chronic arthritis patient can have both problems, uh, fibromyalgia flare and arthritis flare. They both need to be dealt with together. Okay, so that sounds a little bit overwhelming, what we've been talking about, but many patients with the right directed care can do reasonably well with their arthritis and swelling and uh, management. And so the message is don't give up. There are more directed medicines that we can use. Some of them I talked about. And, um, but if you just manage the pain and the swelling and you don't do these things, you'll wind up having a problem over time. So it's important to recognize that Arthritis can make your body weaker and stiffer, and you need to be able to exercise your muscles because when your muscles get weaker, you then have increased pain and stiffness in the joint. Uh, an example is my mother-in-law. She suffered an injury. She's 90 years old, and she said, Russell, my arthritis is much worse now. And I said, Mom, your arthritis in your knee is the same. Your thigh muscles are weaker, okay? And that's a good analogy in terms of just saying, oh, okay, if I can uh, do something like get on an exercise bicycle or an elliptical trainer, not walking, but getting on a bicycle, you can improve the thigh muscles and then hopefully improve joint function and take some of the stress off of your arthritis, arthritic hip or uh, knee and that's evidence-based. There have been studies done in various centers around the country to show that. Uh, we also know core exercises, your, uh, strengthening your abdominal core mu muscles, very, very important, and uh, you need to keep them strong as possible so you're not uh, getting an overuse of your back and spine. Um, and then we need to have the right type of accommodation because if you do everything else right and then you go to work and wind up in the wrong type of desk or the wrong type of chair, you wind up with a problem. So in my experience with my patients, adjustable chairs with adjustable arms, neck and lumbar support are essential. Um, getting a six, sit, stand, sit stand desk and possibly a foot rest can be very, very helpful. Uh, also, uh, telecommuting one or two days a week could be the difference between working and not working. Okay, um, so when we talk about exercise, um, in my experience, because patients ask me many times, what do I do, you know, for exercise? Could you give me a booklet that shows me what exercises to do? Again, I want to compliment uh, the Arthritis Foundation. If you go to their website, in terms of nutrition, in terms of almost everything I'm talking about today, including exercise, they have really significant brochures that can help. Well, they're not brochures anymore. You download them and print them. It used to be brochures. And uh, I'm very, very impressed uh, with what you can find to help yourselves on the Arthritis Foundation website. However, um, in my practice, I often refer patients uh, for a brief consultation with a neuromuscular physical therapist that can actually give you a specific treatment exercise plan designed for you. And then when you come to my office and you say, oh, the flare is over, what do I do now in terms of exercise? I said, don't you have your exercises from your physical therapist? And they say, oh yeah, I have them at home. I'm gonna start doing them again, it's time. Um, so what is a neuromuscular physical therapist? Well, usually they have uh, a PhD in physical therapy uh, or they advertise on their website, you know, that they're um, uh, able to take care of more than just traditional physical therapy. They can look at the uh, problems that you have from a physical therapy point of view and also deal with some of the imbalances in terms of the myofascial pain and maybe misalignment of the hips or spine or things of that nature. It's a very good resource. Um, tai Chi, uh, Pilates, uh, modified yoga, all the mind-body exercises are very, very helpful in terms of managing joint range of motion, muscle tone and balance in my patient population. 
Uh, you can learn to do these routines with confidence. You can either start with a trainer uh, who knows Tai Chi, or you can get uh, 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 online, you can download something from the internet like Tai Chi for beginners, something of that nature. Uh, and mind body meditation can also be very, very helpful in terms of reducing some of the chronic uh, pain of arthritis. Um, and then further accommodations, raised toilet seats, uh, shower seats are really very, very helpful not only for chronic arthritis patients, but probably everybody 65 years of age. <laughs> and also, um, um, I didn't write it there, but you know, the grab bars, uh, very, very important. Uh, first floor uh, bathrooms and uh, uh, bedrooms can be really important, along with railings and ramps to your home. Uh, and those accommodations can keep patients out of assisted living, okay? Because if you think about it, a lot of times, What's the biggest problem? I'm upstairs and I can't get down. I can't do the things I need to do. So it's important to think about these uh, things. And in a lot of the over 50 communities, you can actually basically be in a situation where it's all first floor. And, um, and that might be the difference between assisted living later in life and not. And then if you need other accommodations, there are occupational therapists that can do consultations, come to your house, give you further advice. Okay, um, once your pain levels are more or less acceptable, uh, you tend to have less chronic fatigue. You should also have better physical function. Um, but we need to be able to think about activities of daily living. You need to keep a little bit of a diary, even if you do everything right and then you don't pace you wind up with a flare. And why is that? It's because you have all these pent up things you need to do. And so it's very common to say, oh, I feel better today. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do this. And that can then say, not good, okay? So what do I say to patients? Uh, they say, how do I know if I did too much? Well, if you, if you hurt, right? If I hurt the next day a lot, then I did too much. <laughs> Okay, that's usually the answer. And please get help with lifting, cleaning, cooking, shopping. I know people get impatient, you know, and they just wanna do it. But the bottom line is that if you wait for help with certain things and you're keeping your pain diary, you'll notice, oh, I didn't have as many flares this week. That's a good thing. Ask for work accommodations. Telecommuting is a biggie. More and more companies are willing to give patient, uh, uh, clients, uh, their employees, telecommuting access um, two to three days a week because there's only meetings in the office maybe once or twice a week and they'd rather keep a good employee working than have to train somebody else who doesn't have your experience, your responsibilities and your skills. Okay, so getting uh, back into life, you need to gradually increase your activities, not do everything in one day and you need to focus on what you can do and not what you can't do. Okay, so when we talk about um, comprehensive management of chronic arthritis, we're talking, and this is the summary sheet of this, my last slide. It really requires comprehensive management because chronic arthritis is a chronic illness, just like diabetes and asthma and heart disease. And if you don't get the right diet, it doesn't help. And so we know that there are anti-inflammatory foods. I like saying berries and cherries, but please refer to the Arthritis Foundation sites on foods that are, uh, have anti-inflammatory characteristics and are good for chronic arthritis patients. Omega-3 fish oil, and I do say the non-burpee form or enteric-coated, <laughs> Um, is a very, very important uh, uh, um, supplement for arthritis pain and function, or if you prefer, you can just eat North Sea fish, okay? And uh, the supplement, glucosamine, chondroitin, and MSM, um, I'd like to point out that a lot of the supplements don't have MSM. And in my experience, this is effective in maybe 65% of my patients, with arthritis pain and stiffness that need this kind of supplement. The MSN seems to cause, uh, help you with joint mobility, whereas the other two parts of the supplement seem to help 
with osteoarthritis uh, uh, pain. And then calcium-rich foods are important, obviously, because we don't want to develop secondary uh, osteoporosis and osteopenia. We need to do adequate exercise, paced activities. We need to get the adequate sleep. Often we need a certain amount of medication and sleep aids. Um, uh, um, don't keep all the things in your mind, you know, right before you go to sleep. Good sleep hygiene is very essential. Um, and you need to take a break before you go to bed. That doesn't mean you can forget about everything in your mind. It just means that you try, okay? Uh, supportive uh, low heel shoe wear, um, uh, changing your shoes when they wear out, using orthotics uh, when appropriate, very important, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and other accommodations we talked about, and finally, medications as needed to manage arthritis pain and function. And with this type of comprehensive approach, it is useful to be able to get to the next step. And remember, my talk started with the assumption that you're getting reasonably good control with the biologics and DMARDs or whatever you need for your chronic arthritis, and you still have problems. So the focus of this talk today is what do you do besides those medications, okay? Um, I'm going to ask and answer one question before anybody else asks it, and that is, what if my uh, rheumatologist doesn't have time to talk about all these things, you know, because I'm in there, you know, th uh, every other month or every three months. You might have to actually schedule a separate appointment other than your medication check to say I'd like to talk about these issues, okay? Because they're on a time schedule and they kind of need to know what you're talking about. And so I think that that's what I would recommend is, you know, maybe once a year, you know, have a separate visit just to talk about these issues. And I think the rheumatologists will appreciate that as well. Um, because then they'll have the time, hopefully, to be able to go over the issues that you have. Um, so anyway, um, that's what I wanted to talk about today. And um, I would like to also say that after the talk, I'm not going anywhere. So if you have more questions that are more specific to you, I'm here to uh, talk with you. Yes, ma'am. Let's Hi, um, okay. I'm Stephanie. I had just one quick question. Go ahead. Um, my doctor has put me on six different biologics, mm -hmm. and I've been, I would say my highest percentage is like 75% okay. Right. Um, he seems to think that he can somehow give me a combination of, you know, immunosuppressants and biologics to get me under control where I don't need opioids or pain medicine. Is that realistic? Well, in some cases it is. In other words, if your doctor can basically target your specific problem and you get the type of improvement that you're looking for, it's possible. And if a lot of your joint inflammation is down and you're still having pain, then maybe it's not possible. You know, because I think that's the point I'm trying to raise and the, why I did that study where we went to the major centers. At some point, you have to say, look, you know, even though you've done a good job controlling a lot of my arthritis swelling and I'm not getting new erosions, I'm still not functioning well, right. you know. And at some point, I have to think about taking something else or that might help, okay? And it doesn't necessarily need to be opioids, but the point is sometimes that might help you get started, okay? Because you reach a point of inertia, you know, where you just say, I can't get started, you know? And so I think that at some point you have to set a time limit and say, okay, we tried this, 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 and this, and, you know, do you need another opinion? You know, what are you thinking? Because, it, you know, we have great drugs, you know, but the point is at some point, you might get a side effect from all these medicines that you're taking, and you want to risk another higher level of side effects so that you might get the pain relief that you're looking for. So I think it's a complicated question, um, but I hope that helps you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. 
um, so I take tramadol, and you're kind of talking about um, how it affects like your central nervous system and whatnot. But I seem to take it like when I'm my neck is sore, knees, whatever. So I didn't know if when you're talking about tramadol, if it's supposed to specifically trigger um, your central nervous system, or if you should if it's supposed to help when your joints are sore, because that's what I use it for. Okay. In my experience, it tends to be more of a chronic medicine than something that you just use for a day or two, okay? When you start any medicine that works on your central nervous system, there's gonna be a period of time in the first week or two, an adjustment period, and you could feel increased anxiety, increased pain in the first week or two, and that's why, um, Many, many years ago, I went to the product manager of, uh, tra uh, of Ultraset and Ultram. Uh, at that time, it was owned by McNeil Company. And um, I said, your drug is really more of a chronic pain drug than acute pain, okay? And so I think that that may be what you're asking me. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's the only medicine out there. I'm just saying that my experience is that I don't want people to be afraid of taking a, a Schedule Four medication if it helps them. But it seems to help more for the chronic pain rather than acute pain. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I have, all right, I was diagnosed about 30 years ago. And earlier in my treatment, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia also. Mm -hmm. That was probably like 25 years ago. Um, but since that time, and that doctor, she was my favorite doctor and she left the practice and just broke my heart. But um, I've had several rheumatologists, of course, since that time. Mm -hmm. But I've never been able to get any of the other ones to seriously talk about fibromyalgia. Um, and I've been going to some of the best rheumatologists in my area and they all kind of gloss over it. It's like, well, yeah, maybe you could, but these medications will take care of it, you know? So <clears throat> I have a lot of um, um, rapid heartbeats and my chest is very tender and very sore almost all of the time. Is there something I can do to address that or? As I said, you know, um, it's hard to get really specific, yeah. you know, in a group uh, discussion. And if you make a special appointment, not your regular medication, and you can't get anywhere, you could ask the doctor, if you don't have an answer, who, who should you refer me to yeah. that might give me a second opinion? As far as I'm concerned in rheumatology and many other fields, a second opinion is a win-win, okay? Number one, if the second doctor says the same thing as the first doctor, mm -hmm. you know, then the doctor feels okay. However, if the second doctor has another insight, it helps you and it helps your rheumatologist, okay? So it's n not a bad thing to do is to say, you know, after you've scheduled your pain session for that alone, or the other thing you could say is, okay, don't call it fibromyalgia if that right. bothers you. Call it chronic pain, right. okay? And if that makes you feel better as a treating doctor that you're not treating this condition, I, I have to tell you that um, there are plenty of rheumatologists who still look a little bit um, uh, skeptical yeah. about that condition, but it's now a comorbidity with the exactly. Arthritis Foundation for chronic pain and fatigue. And that's what so, I don't understand because I do have so many comorbidities, I've got lots right. of them, and I don't know why they don't take that one seriously. Well, you know? the point is, up until a little while ago, um, it was something that was um, not really treated as a comorbidity. Now it is, okay? Um, I didn't get into this, but women's issues, okay? If a condition affects women, maybe 85% like fibromyalgia and only 15% in men, there has been concern, you know, like for example, women's heart disease, okay? That was a big issue, you know? When women have angina or heart pain, it's different than men's pain. It's not usually the crushing pain into the emergency room. 
You just say, I have this nagging pain, it's getting in my way, you know? And I, I get shorter breath every once in a while, and I referred that patient to a cardiologist, and she wound up having three stents, okay? Because women's heart pain is different than men's heart pain. So fibromyalgia is more of a woman's diagnosis than a men's diagnosis. So one little caveat might be, you know, speaking to a woman rheumatologist, you know, that might not be a bad idea. I send my patients to women uh, dermatologists, you know, I just feel that that is more appropriate, you know. I wouldn't send uh, a woman with menopausal issues to a male gynecologist on the average, you know, because, you know, there are plenty of well-trained women <laughs> out there, physicians, you know, and I think that maybe that's a little hint as to one of the things that you can do. But sometimes consultation, second opinion, is also a very reasonable thing to do. It's better than just feeling frustrated. That's my point. Yes, ma'am. You and then you, okay? We'll let this lady go first and then you. Um, in your presentation, I feel like pain and fatigue are kind of lumped together, but can they be like separate and treated differently? I feel like my pain is fine, but I'm always tired. I like to sleep through the night eight hours, but I wake up and I'm like, I can't wait to go to bed tonight. Yeah. Yeah, so I said chronic pain and fatigue are linked together, not pain. If you have acute pain, it's not linked to fatigue, okay? It's when that pain is there every day, you know. On the other hand, there are a number of arthritis comorbidities that cause fatigue, okay? And so the, the assumption is, you know, that you're going to go to Dr. Elbow God Baghdadi's uh, talk this afternoon on comorbidities and make sure you don't have another reason for fatigue, okay? Because you could have anemia, you could have all kinds of low thyroid, you know, I mean, there are many, many things that cause fatigue, okay? Uh, some people just have lower energy levels than other people, and if you always had a low energy level, then that's a problem. I think that you know, anybody over the age of 40 that they can't figure out the fatigue might benefit from a sleep study, okay? Because we're finding more and more uh, uh, sleep problems in all patients, you know, over the age of 40. Women, men, overweight, non-overweight. Uh, one of my uh, close friends, um, you know, wanted to retire. And I said, why don't you get a sleep study before you retire? And now he's teaching. You know what I mean? So it is amazing that uh, obstructive sleep apnea seems to be a, a bigger deal. Um, some of my colleagues who are cardiologists now have sleep apnea uh, um, uh, standing orders, you know, for certain patients because high blood pressure, low energy seem to be associated. So as we're living longer, the challenges are different, you know? If everybody passed away at six, 65 to 75, we wouldn't be talking about some of these things. If rheumatoid arthritis patients all became disabled in eight years, we wouldn't be talking about some of these things. But the problem is that, and I know there's a number of patients with juvenile uh, arthritis in the room. And so um, you have to recognize that now you're adults and the challenges are greater than a patient who just had arthritis as an adult, okay? And so some of the core morbidities are different. Some of the sleep issues are different. But the important thing is, thank goodness that we're controlling a lot of this and in the appropriate patient, we have to now deal with the secondary issues and recognize it's not just all about the primary biologics and disease modifying drugs. There's also the secondary issues for many, many patients, which is why I'm up here talking to you folks today. Okay? All right, any other questions? We have a ton of questions from okay. our online audience. Okay. But, Let's get um, started. Yeah. But I'll just read one and then we'll sort of rotate. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but what is considered to be an acceptable level of pain for most people with RA? Should we expect to have no pain at all? And when is the pain indicative that the treatment plan may not be working and we might need to change medications? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so assuming you have chronic arthritis, okay, no pain is not a reasonable situation, okay? Um, you have to expect to have tolerable pain, 
which means, okay, after the first 20 minutes, you know, I'll take a shower, I'll put my hands in warm water, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll have a cup of coffee or whatever I take, and if I really can't function, okay, because of either arthritis pain or, uh, or I'm having too much stiffness, you're probably not getting enough pain medication. Um, now, as the other lady was saying, you know, maybe you don't have your, your doctor, rheumatologist might say, maybe you don't have your uh, biologics and your uh, chemotherapy drugs right, you know. But I think the key thing is that, you know, it's, you know it, it's, this, this is the art of medicine, okay? You don't want to take too much medication. You don't want to take no medication um, if you have chronic arthritis. And so the answer is somewhere in between. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. So I have this issue where I'm fairly new in my diagnosis. I'm less than three years in, but I've had symptoms for years. Mm -hmm. um, I almost feel like I need a validation where my x-rays show no evidence of disease. And I've had MRIs and I'm going down this road and I have all this pain. And it takes me till one, two o'clock in the afternoon for my back and my hip to stop hurting. But I've okay. got no evidence on an MRI. So what kind of weight in general do doctors place on that with my pain levels and my stiffness and my issues and seeing that there's no evidence in the MRI? Well, I think the issue is you need a diagnosis, okay? You know, having joint pain is not a good enough diagnosis. Right. You know what I mean? We know that in early uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, there may not be any changes but you might have tenosynovitis, inflammation around the joints that's rheumatoid arthritis, okay? So sometimes doctors do ultrasound or MRI uh, with a certain amount of contrast okay. to be able to see just what's going on. Sometimes if people have a lot of problems, I don't do it that often, but sometimes you can send somebody to the hospital for what's called a nuclear medicine bone scan yeah. to see if you have any bone turnover anywhere in your body, okay? okay. And if your bone uh, uh, nuclear medicine study is completely normal, then you have to start thinking, well, maybe I do have neurologic pain or soft tissue pain, and it just feels like arthritis pain. Okay. And so the key, as I said before, is a diagnosis. And uh, it can take, uh, you know, over three years to have a change in your x-rays and things okay. like that. And my approach would be, thank goodness you haven't had arthritis it, for 30 years, exactly. you know? Exactly. Like, yeah. I get that part. <laughs> like, I, like, I know it's a good thing, but on the other side, I'm like, but I hurt so much. You need a diagnosis. So, okay. Yeah. Okay? Good. Okay. Hi. Um, I have a question about the myofascial. Is it myofascial My Myofascial, pain? yeah. <clears throat> I had a double knee replacement last April. I still have pain in my quad tendon areas. Mm -hmm. Do you think because I had the joints totally replaced that it's more myofascial pain there? Um, I think my, I might have done my therapy wrong. Okay. <laughs> I think so, I did too much weight lifting okay. too soon. I would think I was misled on what I was supposed to do because they didn't tell me not to. But I still have a lot of pain. I'm fine to walk, but it's going from sitting to standing. And I'm wondering if that, it's right above the kneecap area, right. if that's more myofascial pain then. I don't know what else it could, I mean, the joint's gone, so. <laughs> well, I think there's a couple of issues there. It's a very, very good question, okay? First of all, for whatever reason, it seems to take a year, you know, for the um, soft tissues around the joint to become normal again after uh, uh, knee replacement surgery. Not sure exactly why, you know, but it just takes that long. The other thing is they cut nerves when they do that. So you could have neurologic pain for years afterwards, okay? And if you find that you're getting more tingling in those areas, it may be that nerves are healing, okay? So that's one issue. The only part of your knee that's still yours is your kneecap, okay? So you have to also recognize um, am I having pain in my kneecap? Is it, excuse me? That's right. It's called chondromalacia, okay? And so um, if that's where you're having most of your pain, that is an issue to address uh, with an orthopedic doctor um, that, you know, is sympathetic to that, okay? Um, but I think that the key thing is 
your x-ray looks fine, your knee replacement looks fine. Okay, doctor, I agree. Now let's move on, okay? What's the next step? Okay, so it could be that some of the tendons are too tight, it could be overuse, but if you overused it, you know, there should be a graduated exercise program to get back to where you need to be. And sometimes you run into the problem that the orthopedic physical therapist uh, uh, person um, may run out of ideas and you might want to see a neuromuscular PhD uh, physical therapist to just get some other ideas because maybe there's imbalance. Maybe your hips aren't quite right, you know, and uh, you just had major surgery and your gait may not be perfect, you know, because of all these issues, okay? So I think that the bottom line is, you know, if they say everything's okay with the surgery, let's move on, okay? Let's find out what the next step is to get me back into life more functional, okay? Good. Hello, I'm interested in biosimilars, I believe they're okay. called. Um, I was on one drug when I was working. Mm -hmm. When I retired, I couldn't afford it. The copay was $800, my copay, a month. So I had to switch to a drug in my doctor's office, Simsia I'm on now. Mm -hmm. It does not work as well as the Embril did for me. But Simzia is not a biosimilar. No, but okay. I wondered if there's going to be a bias, biosimilar like the Embril. Um, so that's outside the scope of what I'm talking about today. Okay. But I think that the key thing is that um, if you're on a biologic drug, you know, that is an anti-TNF drug, at some point, they can get uh, um, ineffective, okay? And even if you went back on your embryo, it might not be effective mm -hmm. anymore. So you might need to switch to one of the newer biologic drugs that works in a different way, okay? Because I'm not a big believer in I'll try one anti-TNF, then I'll try a second anti-TNF, um, I think it makes sense if you're using an injectable anti-TNF that you might want to go to uh, an infusion TNF. But at some point you have to say, let's try one of the other uh, accepted treatments for rheumatoid arthritis rather than just focus on that. But there is this whole concept of tolerance to anti-TNFs and you might want to speak to your doctor about one of the other groups of biologics. Okay, okay? thank you. Good. I had a question about the accommodations for work. You mentioned that telecommuting a couple days a week can be the difference between working and not working. And also I having a, a supervisor who's sympathetic. Yes, <laughs> totally. That would lower your stress and help in so many ways. Um, so my situation when I had my last flare, I was out for about six weeks. And when I came back, I used to telework one or two days a week before I had the flare and was mm -hmm. out. When I came back, my doctor specifically requested teleworking as an accommodation, and they said no. They took away telework. So how do they, they think they're helping me by letting me take the days off instead. How do we communicate to our employers that it helps us to work, it helps us to stay engaged and to have our normal, because I'm totally losing that battle right now, and that's making things worse instead of better. That's sad. It's just mm -hmm. really sad, okay? Because um, let's start with disability, okay? Probably the worst thing you can do for many people that can be functional is make them sedentary, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to use your mind, okay? You have skills, okay? And so I think that the key thing is just what you're saying, you know? To say that you think I'm gonna be benefited by working three days a week may not be the right thing, okay? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, it might make more sense to just take two weeks off, do extensive rehab, I don't know your situation, mm -hmm. than to work three days a week, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, however, I will say that there are patients out there that 
do better working four days a week than five days a week, okay? I do that already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so you do that already. Yeah. So, yeah. so in other words, the, the bottom line is you have to figure out um, whether um, this is a problem because they think they're trying to help you <laughs> or they're not trying to help you. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. how, how big an organization are we talking about? It's a small nonprofit. Yeah. So small groups sometimes have bigger problems than large groups, okay? Right. And so um, I can't give you specifics, but um, I don't know. It, it might, sometimes I advise patients to uh, work for the federal government rather than <laughs> small groups. Right. You know, because, you know, you need to recognize you're not doing it only for the money. Mm -hmm. You're also doing it so that you can get the accommodations you need. Yeah. And if you, you're an American, you know, it, it, it's something that, is not a total right, but it's a partial right that, you know, um, hey, you know, um, I've been paying into the government for a long time, and I'd like to be functional. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be non-functional, right. you know? So I think the answer is you need to be assertive. You need to find out the real reasons for what's going on, and uh, it might be time to move on in that way, but at mm -hmm. your time, okay? Right. Not at their time, okay? In other words, you can apply for a job like that and then get the job and then say, now I'd like to, you know, tell you that I have to leave because you haven't accommodated me. Right. And uh, all too often people get mad and then they wind up, you know, saying, well, I'm not going to work here. And mm -hmm. then the next thing you know, you wind up in a bad situation. Right. And you don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Okay. I, I'm in that situation where I'm looking around to decide whether I want to change or not. And the fear of when's the next flare and what happens yeah. at a new job where you don't have FMLA and you don't have an established reputation there, um, right. how to make the decision to make that change. So with some large companies, they have rules on accommodation, mm -hmm. whereas with a, a small company like yours, your value to the company is really a big part of whether they're going to work with you. Right. Okay. Okay. So I think that, you know, at some point, maybe you're, you know, I'm not, I can't talk about specifics, but mm -hmm. at some point, you know, the employer may feel stressed for whatever reason, and it may just make sense to work for a larger company. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. So thank you. This has been great. Another question from the online audience, which I'm told has to be our last question, unfortunately. Okay. But, um, can natural medicine help to manage arthritis pain and flare-ups? If it's complementary, okay? It's not an alternative to the treatments that we're talking about. It has to be complementary. Unless you don't have chronic arthritis, and then you could look at it differently. You know, I think that's really an important point. Um, people said, uh, let's get back to the supplement, uh, glucosamine chondroitin, okay? Uh, people said, oh, it only works in 40% of people, so it's not effective in clinical studies, okay? That means that 40% of people get benefit. So it may not work in a scientific study. And then I said, well, why doesn't it work? Well, because the people still have stiffness. So I found a supplement that has MSN, and it works in 65%. You know, so I think that the bottom line is when you're talking about supplements, you have to treat them with the same type of rigor that you would talk about uh, bio, uh, um, um, prescription medicines, okay? If they help you within three months, you know, then that's fantastic. If they don't help you, then you shouldn't be on them. And I think that all too often, people don't have the same critical sense about a supplement that they do a prescription medicine. And so you need to look at the whole thing. That's what we talk about when we talk about comprehensive care. You know, the comprehensive care includes medication and supplements to manage arthritis pain and stiffness. I think that that is a very good point from that point of view. And I want to thank you all. I hope I was helpful to you folks. I'll stay around to answer any other personal questions if you have it, but thank you for having me.